Hey everybody, Tom Joy here from Visionary Music Group. We're going to do the second video in our Anatomy of a Mix series. This is featuring a song by Cumberland Road called Let It Go. Country rock feel. Check it out. I'll roll a little bit of a verse into a chorus and you get a feel for the song. It sounds amazing Tonight We're gonna rock the canyons The earth is shaking Cool. Okay. If you watched the first video in the series, uh, I went in depth a little bit into organizing the session. I'll touch on that a bit now. And if you need to get a little more detail, you can jump back and watch the first episode of, of that, part one. First thing I do is I organize by color and then order. So on the top, I have these two green tracks. One is my mix print track where I re go out through all my gear and come back in, record into Pro Tools, and that's the mix you'll see here. So track number two is the Mix Auxiliary track, and this routes back to the Mix Print, where the final mix is recorded, and it allows me to do some mix bus processing here. Moving down, all the tracks in yellow are my VCAs, where I can do macro controls, these guys in blue are my sidechain processors. Then below the sidechain processors, in red, are all my aux submasters. There's a couple of effects. And I usually put the drums and percussion on the top, then the basses, then the electric guitars, acoustic guitars, and then whatever effects pertain to those. Then keyboards, AP electric piano, B3s, organ, and maybe effects that pertain to that. And then I'll have my buses for lead vocals and for background vocals. This song's a, basically a two vocalist band duet. So one is lead vocal B and lead vocal J for Bridget and Jose. And background vocals are all the background vocals are bus too. Then I'll have individual channels for each piece that was recorded. So these are our kick in and out mics a kick sample, an ambient kick sample. Then we have the same thing happening with, with the snares, and we'll go into these in depth. Tom Tom's, ambience is a room mics, overhead mics, hat. Then we have our percussion, stick tambourine, snaps, uh, shake and tambourine, shaker. And then our bass, DI, and different amps, acoustic guitars, electric guitars, and purple. Lighter colors if they're less distorted, darker if they're more distorted. Keyboards in yellow, and all my vocals are in green. And then the rest of my effects, blue shade, and dirt down at the bottom. So I know where everything is in every session based on the order they're put in, and then also based on the color. So it's way easy for me to find, especially in a session that has a lot of tracks. Moving on, let's talk about our routing to print and mix bus processing. All of my aux submasters feed out to my Dangerous Music 2-Bus LT summing mixer. So the Dangerous Summing Mixer brings in 32 channels from my Lynx Aurora converters, which I have four of. Two of them handle 32 outputs going into the summing mixer, and the other ones handle all the analog inserts. From the outputs of my aux submasters, I feed 32 channels into my Dangerous Music summing mixers, going through two Lynx Auroras. From the output of the Dangerous summing mixer, 
I feed the input of my Burl bomber, which is taking the analog signal and then converting it back to digital and printing into Pro Tools. So here's the dangerous Convert 2, which lets me convert the digital signal back to analog so I can monitor with the cleanest, most accurate possible signal. And then I'm also going through my ATC monitors. So now we've covered the signal path and the session organization. So let's jump into taking a look at the mix bus processing. First thing in line on the mix bus processor is this VSC2 Vertigo plug-in version by Plugin Alliance. Gives you a VCA style compressor, barely touching, giving me a little gain. The Greg Wells Mixcentric plugin. For some reason, dialing this up to three and adjusting my ins and outs so there's the gain staging is correct. Sounds really good. It adds like a lower mid-range tightness and some sheen on the top. Manly Massive Passive. Manly just for some gentle boost. This one's a little higher than gentle, but these are. And it gives a little analog sheen to it in a nice way. Then I have the Dangerous Liaison B. So this you'll see is an analog insert. So we'll check that out. This is the Dangerous Liaison switcher unit. It has two paths, A path and a B path. It has six loops. And on each of these loops, I have a specific device. On loop one, I have a pair of Tone Lux compressors dedicated for tracking or insert. On loop two, I have a pair of API 525 compressors that I use when I'm tracking or use it on inserts during a mix. And then loop three, I have two Tone Lux EQs that I'll use during tracking or when I'm mixing on an insert. Loop number four, five, and six are mainly dedicated to the mix bus. So on number four, I have a pair of Tone Lux compressors, which add a nice round low end and rain in that part of the mix, but really, really do something nice sonically. And I dial the gain back a bit on those. On loop number five, I have the Dangerous Compressor, which is really kind of pristine, and I'm using it for some glue. And loop number six is the Dangerous Back CQ. And the Dangerous Back CQ has some great filters that I'll use for extra high-end filtering, or maybe if there's low-end rumble, it sort of closes in the mix and really focuses it. Then after that, we're going back into Pro Tools, and I have the BXV2 EQ, and this is a, a mid-side EQ, and I have a tiny bit of cut on the sides and the lower mids, and a similar thing in the mono section. But what's great about it is, is right here, I have the stereo with control, and you'll see that move from section to section in the song. So here I'm in a verse, and it's set a little lower. Then when I get to the chorus, it widens out, and it helps me blow up the choruses a little bit. And then I have this Pro L3 by Fab Filter, and you can see it's not adding a lot of gain. It's just mainly keeping me from going over. And then my favorite thing is the adapter AB. So here I can see a, a spectral analysis of the mix as it's playing. And I can compare it to another mix. And what's great too is you can gain match right in the plugin. So if you have seven or eight of your favorite reference mixes and they were mastered, you can balance them to where you're at so you can do a true comparison. So that's our mix bus processing. Okay, moving on to VCAs. So you'll see here I have these yellow VCA faders. I'll flip to another view. So you can see down here on the names of the faders, all the yellow are the VCAs. And they correspond to groups of other instruments. So you can see one is for basses, one is for drums, one is for vocals, electric guitars, etc. So what's cool about this is if I want to bump the vocals a little, I can just grab the vocal fader and move it up. If I want to do a stem mix, I can mute all of them and unmute just the things I want in the stem mixes. It's a really great and convenient way to do things in the mix. And you'll see over here, there are some automation moves happening in different parts of the song. And most likely it'll be a dip in a verse, a bump up in a chorus. And in certain instances of some songs, you'll see the downbeat of the chorus getting bumped up to give it a little more emphasis. So there's our VCAs. 
Moving on to our sidechain processors. So the sidechain processors are not delays, chorus, modulation, reverbs. These are channels with compression or EQ on them that are used as a parallel processing. Let's take a look at our sidechain processing. Sidechain A is an analog insert. It's an API 2500. I send all my drums and basses to that and percussion. Sidechain B has this Neve compressor and this Brainworks widener on it and some EQing done. And that's for all the instruments that are going out to the sides or that sustain like keyboards. Sidechain C, ITB, uh, ITB in my template indicates that this used to be done with hardware, now it's being done with software, is Universal Audio 1176. So this one I like to add onto any instruments that I feel like need a little more push to the front or need some mid-range punch. So this tape sidechain is a UAD simulation of the uh, Ampex tape machine. And what's great about this is I can have this in, in varying amounts on the mix and it doesn't have to treat the whole mix. I pretty much run everything through it and then I just push this up as needed. So now this next bunch of side chains are dedicated to drums. So kick and snare drum crush, a DBX 160 hitting pretty hard that the kick and snare drum go to. Bass and kick glue, Shadow Hills compressor, which helps the low end of the track stay focused and not fight with each other. A uh, second bass and kick glue is Billy Decker bass plugin, which is doing an emulation of the retro stay level or gate stay level, which I used to have, but now I, f I find I can get it happening in the box. And this is great. All of Billy Decker's plugins are great. He's an awesome engineer. And this one, Shells, is mainly used for kick, snare, toms. So the wooden shells of the drums. And this took the place of my I had a couple of distressors and I really liked them and I've eventually got this close emulating it. Then I, I have just a, a bass side chain, again the Billy Decker one, set differently than the other one and it's a little more extreme and I can, I can push this up or down in different parts of the songs. Then I have a sub bass and this is the Brainworks Plugin Alliance subharmonic generator which helps the bass have like a lower octave. Now we got guitar side chains. A pull tech preceded by a, an LA3A, which is really sound, they sound great on guitars and this plugin's nice and does the job. And the Billy Decker guitar plugin, which is really cool. And, and the pull tech again. Why have two? Why have three? Why have any? They're different tonal variations and different levels of push the mix can have. So we can EQ for height, you know, super high end added makes the mix sound taller, low end makes it seem lower. We can EQ for depth or width with effects, but in order to get the mix to feel like things are moving forward and back with whatever's happening, like interacting with the audio, the only way to really do that is with compression. But you don't want to compress everything to death and lose your dynamics. So side chaining the compression gives you this pulsing kind of feel, but it also gives you various tonal combinations that you can use or not use and I have so many of them because they're in my template and they're ready to go so if I don't like one I just shut it off if I like it I use it I don't touch them I don't change them whatever the source material is will be depending upon if I use it or not let's keep moving vocal side chain so here's a perfect example of how I have a few of them so number one is 1176s which sound great Number two is a combination of things. Uh, when I had my multiple distressors, I, um, I like to put one on vocals to help a vocal in the chorus. Or if a singer had, you know, had a wispy voice and the song started to rock a little, this is really based on that. And then these guys help push it. And this virtual channel gives it a little bit of saturation. And moving down, the Abbey Road TG plugin. This is a great, like, saturator for vocals for me and I've tried it on a mix and I've you know and I liked it on the mix but once again you have to experiment take everything you have you don't have to have a lot of things but get to know what you have you put it on the mix put it on groups of instruments and see what happens 
And then I have a gate after this, just in case I, I push it and the noise from the desaturation is too much. Background vocals, uh, Billy Decker Vox plugin sounds great as a sidechain for vocals. And last one is the Fairchild. You can see it's set pretty much for stun. But because it's on a sidechain, I can bring it in as I see fit. And some of these things will also happen in choruses and not happen in verses. So as when we get to the automation, you'll see all that. So there's all our sidechains. So we covered the mix bus processing and the sidechain processing and talked about it. So let's hear some of it in action. So I'm gonna play the verse into the chorus and I'm going to uh, let you hear it with the mix bus processing in and then we'll go again with it off. Now it's all in. It sounds amazing. Tonight, we're gonna rock the canyons. The earth is shaking. Okay, so now we're going to hear the entire mix with no mix bus processing. It sounds amazing. Tonight, we're gonna rock the canyons. The earth is shaking. So you heard the difference when I kicked it back in. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. I leave these on when I'm mixing at the, I put them in in the beginning, they're in the template. So once I start working, I don't have to do as much individually because these are already there. And this is once again, a combination I've worked on and modified and you should do the same. So having these in place on my template and ready to go not only saves me from adding too much processing down the line, it allows me to get to where I want to be much, much faster. So let's take a listen now to how the sidechain processing affects the mix. So an interesting thing, you see over here all my markers. I have markers also for viewing. So if you have a session, for instance, like this, here's everything in the session. Okay, and now we just want to look at the side chain. We'll just hit the side chain marker. So, and those are built into my template too. So in my template, I have all my tracks and channels for mix bus, side chain, effects. They're all ready to go. So the markers come in with it. Let's talk about the side chain. So I'm gonna play the same spot in the mix and I'm gonna bypass the side chain that I'm gonna pop them in. This is out. Now I'll put it in. To see your faces. Look down the crew and cry. I'll get near. We are family now. So these are preset once again in my template. And they average somewhere between minus 25 and minus 10. And then they, they may move through different parts of the song, depending upon what I want to emphasize. So how my, my faders actually move going into it uh, will be affected a little further down downstream. So that's all the sidechain processing. Next up, we'll do the aux submasters. So now let's take a look at our aux submasters. So at the top, you'll see we have kicks, snares, toms, drum M is for metal, meaning cymbals, overheads, hi-hats, uh, drum ambience, and then we have our claps, percussion. And then after that, we have basses, etc. down the line for every group. Our kicks would be all of the kicks 
in the session. So for instance, we have kick in, kick out, kick sample one, kick sample two. They all go into that kick aux master. Same thing with the snare. Same thing with the toms down the line. In the case of ambient samples, where we have uh, a stereo kick ambience, a room, stereo snare rooms, they would go to the ambient channel. Each of them have their own specific signal path. And if you'll notice, most of these are pretty close to zero. I might have boosted them at one point. But if I start my session with those at zero, then I can get my gain structure right. And then the channels as they come in, I can just move them where I see fit. Or if you get a, a session from a client that has been really working hard on their balances, why start over if they like them? Just send them here, leave their balances and route them appropriately. Easy. So let's take a look at what we have on each of them. So on the kicks, you'll see there's some things here that are inactive. So the, the inactive things to me save me from scrolling through my long list of plugins to find stuff and lets me just activate whatever I need. So in this rack here behind me, I have all my tone locks and API EQs that I use for mixing. So the first one is dedicated to kick, second to snare, three and four to, to the drum rooms, and five and six to toms. Then I also have a pair of 1176s and Pultex. One 1176 is usually dedicated to a kick and one Pultec goes with that, and one is for the snare and the one pull tech goes for that. This saves me from changing anything if I have to do recalls. If it works, I run it through it. If it doesn't, I do not. So you can see here, the snare went through the 1176, but the kick didn't. So moving down, we have two aux submasters for bass. So why do we need two aux submasters for bass? It's pretty simple. Sometimes you want the bass to be louder, but you don't want more high end or more low end. So I split it up. So the first one has the general bass tone and most of the low end. And the second is pretty thinned out and has all of the highs. So if you'll notice on the high one, you'll see it's all dipped out down here. And on the first one, none of that is dipped out. And I'm using this great Elysia EQ to boost the low end. And I also have the Manly ELOP outboard compressor on this. So the combination of those can be really helpful, and you'll notice in different parts of the song, I've automated them to be more effective. And the next batch is these guitars. So on these guitar subs, you'll notice I have a insert, which is my API 550s, followed by the SPL Vitalizer, which I'm using for the stereo expander. And then for this tremolo guitar, the LA3A, and then this API vision channel strip. And then the pedal steel sounded really good the way it was, so I put the LA3A just to sort of even everything out. And I usually don't put reverb directly on an aux master I will send to it, but in these guitars, in this case, I use this concert hall setting on this great Valhalla vintage verb for the steel. And on the trem guitar, I wanted it to simulate, you know, a really good spring reverb, so we use the AKG Spring Reverb plugin. Then acoustic guitars. Billy Decker acoustic, which is uh, nice. And sometimes, you know, the acoustic guitar has to almost be a percussive element in the track with some harmonic content, so that helped me with that. Then this is a great plugin. This is a nice way of, you can add some high end with this air band, but you can also pick some compression and it's really picking a harsh band and compressing it. Then after the acoustic guitars, I have keyboards, which were samples and they were sounded pretty good. And uh, on the auxes, I didn't do much. I probably did this after I dealt with the individual channels to put them in a better spot in context in the mix. Then moving on to the two lead vocal tracks. This is an awesome plugin, Soothe by Oak Sound. It's a multi-band, real-time analyzing compressor that will find harsh frequencies in a vocal and remove them. Phoenix tape emulator, I use that on vocals all the time. It really does something, it sounds great, and it, you know, it gives it a nice round warmth without making it sound dull. Pro-Q, FabFilter EQ, which is awesome. 
taking out all the low and unnecessary rumbles that may be there and maybe a couple more little spots that are harsh. Then I have this Blue Stripe 1176, which is really fantastic for vocals. It has a great, great sound for that. And then I have a de-esser, of course, because we're probably boosting a fair amount of high end. And here's where more high end's coming. This uh, Seaman EQ copy emulation by Sound Toys, which is great. They make great stuff. Then on the next vocal channel, I have all the same plugins, and they were adjusted differently because one's a male vocal and one's a female vocal. And then down here on the background vocals, it's pretty much the same, except I went to my go-to Plugin Alliance SSL EQ. So there's all the aux submasters. So moving on to drums. My drums are always in red. First thing on every drum track I always use is the Sound Radix Auto Align. This will phase and time align all the drums so that they have the best, most in phase possible sound, which really, really helps with letting you do way less EQ. I had this Pro Q2 here, it's bypassed. I'm probably not using that anywhere. So we will just make it inactive. So these things come up in my template and it's, it's pretty easy, you know, to get to get where you want to be. So for instance, I have here done some work, but I have a starting point, a preset. You can see where it says start. It's, it's italicized because I adjusted it. So that gives me most of the things the way I want it. It'll have some low end roll off, some high end roll off. It'll place the, you know, uh, the EQ before the dynamics and it'll set the gate up a certain way so that it won't hurt anything. And then I could, I could change as I go on the fly. So mostly every channel would have the auto align and then the, um, the, the SSL. Now, kick S is sample. And this is the Chris Lord Algae samples of a DW 24 inch bass drum. And then I have a kick ambient sample, which is the same, but it's all the room mics and overheads. Now, why split them up, you may ask? Why not just have them in these other open slots over here on your trigger plugin. Pretty simple, because with the submixing, the way the summing mixers work is the summing mixer, mixer actually takes a signal and has a switch that'll make it mono or stereo. So you saw in that, that picture there, one, two, three, four were set to mono. So in those cases, one is kick, two is snare, three is bass, for as lead vocals. So it gives you a true analog mono position in the mix, which really, really helps the stereo imaging. And you'll see on the rest of those, the uh, other light is on and they're all set to stereo. So if I took the kick and the kick samples, including the ambient sample, and sent them all to the kick aux master it would force them to mono since the kick aux master is in mono and i like to have the ambience in stereo so i send the kick sample with the ambience on it to the drum ambient submaster which is a, sends it to a stereo app and the same thing with the snare and you'll see we have the trigger here now on this one i have two different snares i have the chris lord algae ludwig brass and I have a Brady snare, a Brady snare. I think that's Blackbird, a Blackbird sample. And of course, if I used a Blackbird sample, I would definitely use their chamber. Oh, this is uh, another Crystal Algae, the Dong sample. So it's pretty much the uh, the Crystal Algae I, I use a lot, and the uh, Blackbird. And then I have a bunch of Billy Decker one shot samples that I use too. And then I've got some that I've gotten over the years from folks and made my own. So down here, you'll see a sample ambient. And that would be the room mics, as we discussed, going out to the drum ambience sub, which would be stereo. Then I have my toms. And then we have room mics. And it's all pretty much standard fare, nothing more than an SSL. Um, and then we have stick tambourine, snaps, tambourine, and shaker. So let's try 
something for fun, let's talk a minute about the phase alignment with the drums. So let's check out the phase aligning of just the drums. So here are the drums with the bypass, and then I'll pop it in. Bypass. So it lends quite a bit more focus to the low end, a little clarity to the high end, and that helps me just get there faster. That's really what this whole thing is about. So there is all your drums and percussion. So let's move on to our basses. So we discussed the side chain basses, high and low. Let's take a look at and talk a little bit about these three bass inputs. So if you notice, I have auto align on the bass. So the bass DI is auto aligned to the kick. And then the two different bass amps or amp simulators are auto aligned to the DI. So the first one we have is Sans Amp, which sort of gives us SVT-ish kind of growl. And the second one I have on here is the B15, Ampeg B15 simulator. And that gives us more low end vibe. So let's check out one at a time. Here's the DI. Now the Sans Amp. And now the B15. So now let's check out all the bases in, and we're going to shut off the high and the low bass aux submasters. So here's both. Now I'm going to mute the high. Now the high in. And now the overall bass with the lows out. And there are our basses. Moving on to acoustic guitars. So in this tune, we have quite a few acoustic guitars. Let's see what we have. Okay, so we have a, a Gibson acoustic. Then we have a, a Tacoma Papoose, which is a steel string tenor guitar. So it's sort of my cheating mandolin method. And then we have a second acoustic, which is a Martin D28. And then we have a double of that same Martin. So let's hear the first acoustic. So that acoustic is panned, so it's obviously meant to work with this papoose. So here's the two of those together. So you can see it gives it a little rhythmic bounce and a different tonal variation. So I'm going to play the chorus now. The two, the Martins, the bigger guitar, the Dreadnought, comes in in the chorus, and then that's doubled. So we have the two guitars, uh, first guitars, the Gibson and the tenor here, and then when the chorus comes, you have the wider spread out Martins. So we'll check that out. Martins out, then Martins in. Chorus, and they're out.
chorus and they're in. So there's our acoustic guitars. Let's listen to our drums, bass, and acoustic guitars together so far and see what we have. So you can hear the change to the chorus when everything lifted and kind of blew up before we even get to the electric guitars and the keyboards. And the idea was, uh, you know, the guitars that played in the verses were sort of muted kind of strumming and they kind of opened up to wide open strumming. Then you had the two big dreadnoughts on the outside. And then the whole vibe of the drums and the bass change, you could actually hear how I pushed up some of that side chain compression and rode some of those level ups. So the chorus really had a nice lift. Okay, up next, electric guitars. So on this tune, it was fairly simple. There was not a lot of electric guitars. Let's check them out one at a time. First electric guitar. Double. You can hear that there was two different electrics and the sound changed obviously there was a leslie pedal in the pre-chorus and the chorus it was off and that a little more dirt so there was two different guitars and let's see what we used this indicates the first one is a duesenberg which uh, is a gibson gretchy kind of hybrid with a couple of pedals and a uh, rsa 23 divided by 13 and the api amps uh, api sorry eqs it was cut with and the second one was the same setup, except it was a Telecaster, and I had a compressor, pedal compressor on it. So we'll check those again. Left side first is the Duesenberg. So you could hear on the left was the, the Meteor guitar, on the right was the Brighter, which was the Tele. You could also hear that the, the left, the Duesenberg, had the fast Leslie, and the right side had the slow Leslie. So anything you can do to give you a different perception of, of height and depth and pulse or, you know, is really helpful. Then the next guitar in the lineup is the Baritone. So this comes in in the bridge and it has the distressor plug-in. So let's hear that in context, the electrics in that. So that was really meant to fortify the melody. So the last electric we have is our pedal steel.
So the pedal steel, one of them, the main pedal steel, had uh, outboard processing through one of my sides of the liaison, and it had the Tone Lux compressor, which mainly was not compressing much, but giving some low end oomph, and the API 525 compressor, which does something really, it's like a feel good thing. You just barely move the meter and put it on and everything sounds good. And this down here, 8VB, was an octave lower in those parts, one that could steal one high. And then that went through the Aux Master, which had the Valhalla Verb. And all it really had was this. There wasn't really an EQ on it. So you can see what I mean about doing things to the to the side chains and doing it to the master uh, two bus. So I don't have to do as much later. So there's our electric guitars. Now we're going to move on to keyboards. Just a simple track. We just had a B3 organ and we had an electric piano. In my template, I normally have aux submasters for a lot of different keyboards, synths, strings, pads, uh, electric piano, acoustic piano, organ. So in this case, we just needed the two, and I didn't really need any of these other options. The only thing I did down here on the B3 was we used the culture vulture for some overdrive. Let's check that out. Get to a spot where there's an organ playing. Bypass that. Bring it back. So the culture vulture saturation helps round off the top end of the B3, which I'm also cutting out a bunch of back on the uh, aux submaster. Helps it fit a little better. and also gives a little more authentic growl to the, the Leslie sound. And it's, it's, it's a, a better growl than adding, adding that in on the plug-in, I think. Then the acoustic piano, we'll check that out. Bright so it cuts, and compressed so it cuts. Now we add the B3. So here's the bridge with the keyboards and all the other instruments in. So there's our keyboards. Moving ahead, let's check out all our vocals. So we discussed earlier all the sidechain processing and we discussed the aux masters. So up here you have our two different aux masters uh, for the two leads and one for the backgrounds. So let's pop up to a chorus and take a listen and I'm gonna loop that. And we'll solo these vocals and see what we have. We are family now. It's been a long ride just to get to here. Playing music from the soul. Another long day set to disappear. So on the vocal channels, I didn't use that much, but I did use the JST Clipper to give a little oomph to one of them. And let's see what we have here. This one probably was a little bright, so I added some more of that. And this guy to push it ahead, which is pretty much the pattern if they need help. Then I do like a couple of bands on this Neve. So on some of these parts, which are a different singer, I'm using a third singer to double to help you know add some weight to things in the bridge. So um, she needed a different EQ setting than the others, 
and I didn't want to set up a new aux for that. So it's really simple, just drop one in here and ride on these auxes. So let's listen to the chorus again, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna mute some things. This will be the the chorus with all the plugins out on the submasters. Just to get to hear Play music from the soul Now I'm going to drop in the Soothe plugin. Set to disappear All right Just to get to hear Play music from the soul Another long day Set to disappear now the Phoenix. Just to get to hear, play music from the soul. So you heard that the smooth took out some of the harshness, but some of the low end thump was gone. So the, the Phoenix sort of helps make that up without affecting the high end. So now the Pro Q is a simple, you know, just a hel tone helper. So now I'm going to play it without the 1176, and then I'm going to add the 1176. Just to get to here. Now I'm gonna drop it in. Play music from the soul. Another long day set to so you can hear how that pushed it way in the front and started to make it sound like a record. Now I'm gonna do the same thing with the sound toys EQ, and this will give it the sheen. Just to get to hear In Play music from the soul Another long day set to dip So by far, vocals have the most processing, but they have to get above and beyond everything else that's happening. And you're also kind of in this position where with instruments, you can use different sounds, you can use different guitars, different amps, a different keyboard and find spots in the frequency range and the arrangement for it to work. But your singers are themselves and you have to help them. So that's where all this comes in here. So here's our background vocals with our chorus leads. We are family now. It's been a long ride just to get to here. So what we did from an arrangement standpoint, that that some you know this is important too to your mixing approach because you could add things or you could mute things if somebody has too many things. We had our, our third singer come in, and since there was a, two lead singers, they were covering you know one the melody and the harmony. The third singer came in and doubled the melody and doubled the harmony, and then did a harmony, a third part, and tripled yes tripled all that so here's just the background singer now noticing that soloed you're probably thinking you're crazy it's super bright and thin but when it was all in the mix of things the lead singers double themselves and their fundamental tone was already there. It really needed some other harmonic element and some shine to it, so that's why those are EQ'd that way. So let's go back and add the leads again. We are family now. It's been a long ride just to get to here. Play music from the soul. Another long day set to disappear. All right. So there's all our vocals for the chorus. Let's check out the bridge. Light a fire, let it go. 
Time is unknown. Music's in motion, and I'm falling in. Come get swept away. Pretty straight ahead, three singers. Now at the end, we added a nice little more of a gospel-y thing. Check that out. Let it go. Let it go. So there's all our vocals. So that was Anatomy of a Mix Part 2, Let It Go by Cumberland Road. Hope you enjoyed this. We have many more coming. So please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so we can let you know when there's more content. And if you have any comments, let us know. There'll be a link to this song, this uh, Reverb Nation page for this band. And eventually these songs are not released yet on Spotify and Apple Music, but they will be in the next month or two. So we'll keep you posted on that. Thanks, hope you enjoyed it.